Welcome everyone to Buddha's Center. My name is Jeff Allen. Uh, this evening, once again, we're looking at Pension Son Andrapa's General Meaning and Perfection, uh, specifically the section on the awakening mind, uh, bodhicitta. Uh, and within that section, now we're on the practice of equalizing and exchanging self with others. Uh, so very exciting. Uh, this isn't a teaching that's uh, transmitted if we look historically uh, to everyone. Uh, so we should feel so fortunate that this evening we're here uh, and we're able to uh, listen uh, to this holy, holy teaching. Uh, so um, this teaching, uh, before we get started, uh, let's get into a specific posture that will allow us uh, to set a motivation, uh, a motivation that's intentional, uh, that says I'm doing this in order to get in the best possible position to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings, because it's stated in the text that if we get into a posture where we're very straight uh, and we can do what we can within that posture, uh, it will create more clarity within our mind. Uh, and then eventually when the body becomes more important in terms of our practice, as we uh, get into uh, more of the deeper stages and we reach different pliancies uh, and we want to practice Tantrayana, uh, then uh, this uh, will allow us to have the foundation uh, that's set up uh, that will uh, uh, be proper for us to practice those things later on uh, when we're actually dealing with the body and the internal channels and winds and so forth. Uh, if they are aligned, uh, then you know some of the battle uh, has already been fought by the preliminary practices. Uh, so uh, we'll get into this intentional posture, the seven-point Virakana posture, where we put our legs into the Vajra posture if we can, or cross-legged or just on the floor, however we can. Uh, if we have uh, some sort of physical ailment that won't allow us to get into that Vajra posture, uh, which many of us do, or if we're not trained to get into it, we do what we can. Uh, so we put our legs into whatever posture we can get into, the, into, ideally Vajra. We put our hands right on top of our left with our thumbs touching, uh, making a diamond shape. And we put them comfortably in our lap allowing for our arms to bow out slightly, make our back straight, allowing for our spine to be like a stack of coins with our shoulders in a comfortable position, our head slightly forward, our eyes slightly open, uh, slightly open, uh, gazing 45 degrees down. And eventually, uh, as we've said many times, uh, we are trying to meditate with the mental consciousness. So all of the sense consciousness, the visual things that we're seeing, that blurry uh, object uh, at the tip of the nose, which is, is just a direction, uh, becomes nothing uh, in terms of perception, in terms of apprehension, uh, because the only apprehension that should be going on is the one that we're directing our mind to. Uh, so uh, that's an, a goal. Uh, but we get into a posture that will aid us in that goal. Uh, it's a lot easier for us to eventually make uh, that, you know, very, very limited amount of sensory visual perception disappear than it would be if we were looking around and our eyes were wide open and we had a lot of stimuli. Uh, so another foundation for us to be able to eventually uh, achieve some sort of greater uh, aim. Uh, and then finally, uh, after the eyes, we have the mouth, we put it into a comfortable position with our tongue at the top of our roof of our mouth, uh, kind of against the, our teeth. And this allows for our mouth to circulate. And by breathing in and out of our nose, uh, you'll see uh, that your mouth will not dry out. And it's obvious that when you have your tongue pressed on the top of your roof of your mouth with it against your teeth, now, breathing out of your mouth becomes quite complex. Uh, so you see that uh, it's all positioned in such a way so that we use our, our nose breathing uh, so that we can for very, very long periods of time in the future uh, be able to sit without any kind of obstacles. Uh, so we got into this position. Uh, we're in this position so that we can quickly become Buddhas uh, for the sake of all sentient beings. Uh, and then next we're going to focus uh, on the breath. So we've got a position that we've gotten into, uh, and we've got an object that we're going to decide to put our minds to focus on. We're going to tell our minds uh, <laughs> for once what to do. Uh, usually our minds are uh, crazed 
uh, and going here and there, and we really don't have much control over them. Uh, the point of this practice is to kind of rein it in. So we're going to tell our minds what to do. Now we're going to tell our minds while we're in this position to focus on the breath and focus only on the breath. I'm breathing in, breathing out, one. Breathing in, breathing out, two. Uh, so we're going to begin by focusing on that breath, breathing in and breathing, breathing out. Uh, and then we're going to, going to, once we've calmed our minds down uh, and we've gotten a lot of the excitement uh, out of the way uh, that might be causing problems uh, by using the breathing and, you know, uh, maybe uh, the excitement, whether it's attachment or whether it's anger, uh, we're kind of moving that out of the way uh, with the breathing. Uh, and we're telling our minds we're only going to focus on the breathing. Uh, and then uh, we will, uh, once we get to a little bit of a calmer state, uh, we'll each individually know when we're at that point, uh, begin to visualize Buddha Shakyamuni in the space in front of you, about two feet in front of you at eye level, about two inches, with all the radiance you can imagine, not a normal body uh, like we think of with blood and bones and uh, organs and so forth. This is a light body, a diamond body, but a full three-dimensional body of an actual being, just a pure being who has no contaminated aggregates. Uh, so we imagine Buddha Shakyamuni in the space in front of us or whatever uh, meditational deity we use uh, currently uh, for our um, uh, single pointed concentration. Uh, so let's meditate on the breath and then slowly meditate on the breath and focus on the image of a Buddha uh, in front of us. Um, so we'll do that for a minute or so. So we begin to think about the Four Noble Truths. Beginning to think about the truth of suffering, the Buddha stated that this is the superior truth of suffering. Start to identify what that is. Start to think about the eight types of suffering, the suffering of birth, aging, sickness, and death, and how they relate to you. The pleasant things you had to be separated from. The unpleasant things you've had to meet. The times you didn't get what you wanted. being forced into these aggregates, these parts that are the basis for suffering. Think about the uncertainty of cyclic existence. Think about how these loved ones that we have right now may have been our greatest enemies in our previous life. And how we want so badly to be with them again, but they may be our enemies in our next life. And it causes us suffering and pain when we think about this uncertainty. Think about how we're never satisfied. 
We get everything that we want. We're comfortable, yet we aren't satisfied. We have to be reborn again and again and again. It's stated in the sutras that if we were to start to take a piece of earth from the earth we know, the size of a jumina per verity, and start to pluck it. When we ran out of earth, we won't have ran out of mother sentient beings. We won't have ran out of rebirths where sentient beings have been our mothers. There would be more mothers in our rebirths and there would be pieces of earth the size of juniper berries. We've had to shuck off these bodies over and over and over again. And as we shuck them off, we go from the high realms to the lower realms. Like a merry-go-round that isn't fun. We go up, we go down like a Ferris wheel, around and around and around in cyclic existence. And when we leave, we will have no companions. No one will accompany us. Our parents will have passed if we live our full life. Our children will have many years to live if they live their full life. No one will accompany us. And where will we go? Wherever we go, we'll have to experience among the three types of suffering. Suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, the pervasive compounded suffering. There's nowhere in cyclic existence where we don't have any among the three types of suffering. And the Buddha stated that that pervasive compounded suffering, which forces us into these positions of the eight sufferings and the six sufferings and so forth. Is the real type of suffering we need to abandon. Hold on one second. I apologize. Oh, Mila, get down. Mila, get down. Get down, honey. We have a pit bull intruding. Okay, good girl. All right. Uh, sometimes uh, this happens, right? When you live with four pit bulls. Uh, so we think about the pervasive compounded suffering and that we're forced in these positions. We're forced to experience the eight types of suffering uh, and the six types of suffering. We'll have to go from the high to the low and the low to the high over and over and over again. Think about the real personal sufferings that we've had to experience. Maybe some of those sufferings that have brought us to the Dharma, the dissatisfaction that brought us to the Dharma. And start to think about what the Buddha stated about the causes of our suffering are. The Buddha stated that this is the superior truth of origin. And Buddha said that suffering has a cause and the cause is our ignorance. The ignorance that grasps at a self as being truly established. The Buddha said this is the first two truths that I've shown you that show you how you're bound to cyclic existence. And then the Buddha stated that this is the superior truth of cessation and said that we could be free, free of all of our fears, free of all cyclic existence. Because the cause of our suffering 
could be abandoned. And then the Buddha was very, very specific about how the cause of that suffering would be abandoned. And the Buddha stated that it would be abandoned by relying upon a truth that was understood by superior beings. And that truth is a pathway. So the pathway of truth, that noble pathway realized by superior beings was the way that someone like myself uh, could end suffering forever. So that's a relief. So you go through these various levels and understandings of suffering, and it seems very negative. But there's hope uh, because suffering is impermanent. And, that, and it's caused. And we know that if a cause of a result is removed, then there is no result. So we're so happy that we are in a position where we've been presented with a way to end our suffering forever. A real way to end our suffering forever. Now we start to think about other sentient beings. Sentient beings we're close to, those we love. Start to think about those beings that are neutral to us. Start to think about the birds flying around, the bees flying around, the squirrels running around, the rabbits running around. Start to think about those beings that we consider enemies and recognize that they want happiness just like we do. And that in previous lives, they were kinder to us than we can ever imagine. The highest level of kindness that we felt in this life, the most amount of love that we felt in this life has been given to us by all sentient beings. So those beings that we consider our enemies at this moment, we're misunderstanding. We, we aren't seeing them as the kind being that they are. We recognize that all of these different types of beings, even the ones that we don't know about, or haven't seen, or have only read about, want happiness. The hell beings would just like a moment of cool if they're in the hot realm. The cold hell realms being with just like a little warmth. Hungry ghosts would like just a little food or just a little drink that they could swallow. The animals would just like a moment of peace where they knew they were okay. They knew nothing was gonna hurt them. Humans just wish they could be free of all these fears and anxieties and stress. They could just be happy. The demigods just want happiness. The gods crave more happiness. And we recognize that the kind of happiness that most beings know about is just bait to more suffering. And that permanent happiness is the only real solution. So we start to wish how nice it would be if all of these beings could have happiness. May they have happiness. I'll be a cause of that happiness. How nice it would be if these beings were free from suffering. May they be free from suffering. I'll be a cause for them to be free from suffering. We say to ourselves, I'll take on this task of freeing everyone. But we realize all we have at this point is a desire to definitely emerge, but no emergence. We aren't free ourselves. We aren't able to be reliable for them. 
We can't truly help sentient beings. We haven't helped ourselves. We haven't reached a state where we have happiness to give. We haven't reached a state where we can teach a being how to end their suffering at their individual level and scope because we're not omniscient. So this causes us to want to become Buddhas because we know the Buddha is the only reliable guide that we take refuge in. We desire to definitely emerge from cyclic existence. We go for refuge to that Buddha. And we know we go for refuge to that Buddha because that Buddha is the only reliable guide and that all sentient beings need a reliable guide. The only way we can truly help them is to become that reliable guide. Think of all the beings in the world and how many of them will hear about this truth. How many of them will be able to generate a mind that loves all beings? Think about how few those are. Think about how many beings need help and know that you're here for that reason. Know that you're here uh, to become a Buddha, to become the most reliable guide, the best helper for all of those sentient beings that need help so much. May I become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. May I become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. May I become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. I'm attending this class tonight to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. I'm listening to the prayers tonight to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. I'm looking at the implicit and explicit meaning of the Heart Sutra to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. I understand to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. I have to progress the paths that are implicitly presented within the Heart Sutra. Teata Om Gate Gate, Paragate, Parasangate, Bodhisoha. The path of accumulation, the path of preparation, the path of seeing, the path of meditation, the path of no more learning are the only pathways which will lead me to Buddhahood, starting with bodhicitta at the path of accumulation. I'm here tonight to be able to generate that mind that aspires to enlightenment. I'm here tonight to be able to practice the teachings shared in common with beings of small capacity and understand them, to practice the teachings shared in common with beings of medium capacity and understand them, and to practice the beings of the practice to practice the stages of the path for beings of great capacity and dependence upon those two earlier stages. It's for that reason that I'm here tonight. So now imagine that in the space in front of us, all the gurus and Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are there. Imagine Ken Sergeshe Wandak. Imagine His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Geshe Lopsan Gompo, Geshe Aga, Geshe Ma Tenzin Ladrinla, all of these great beings, Demolocha Rinpoche, all the Gandan Tree Rinpoches, Sharpa Chuje Rinpoche, Shanta Chuje Rinpoches, all the great beings that are around today. Imagine all of the masters and Indian pandits, the space in front of you. Imagine uh, the Lord Maitreya and the lineage of the extensive deeds that goes to a Sangha. And imagine the masters like Basubandhu and Dignaga and all the holy beings of that lineage. Imagine the profound view lineage beings, Manjushri and Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti and Arya Deva and Buddha Palita and Shanti Deva. Imagine all of these wonderful beings, all of these holy beings, Manjushri, Shanti Deva, Chenrezi, Shakyamuni Buddha, Vajrapani, all of these holy beings are in the space in front of you. And imagine that they're all so happy. Imagine Lord Atisha is there and Lama Tsongkhapa is there. Uh, imagine they're all so happy with us um, because their sole aim is for us to become Buddhists uh, so that, that we can then uh, have all of our suffering be relieved uh, and have the utmost happiness. Uh, that's their sole aim is to see us be able to do that. And they're so happy we're engaging in something that will allow for that to happen. Imagine that they're smiling. Imagine that they're rejoicing. Uh, and it should make us so happy that we're making holy beings so happy. Uh, 
uh, we're able to do something that makes a holy being rejoice. And how often can we do that? Um, we're engaging in that which will cause us to become Buddhas. We're engaging in that which will cause us to enter into the Mahayana. So all the gurus and Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are all so happy uh, to see this. And smiling. And Sir Geshe Wanda is so proud that we've carried on these teachings and that we're still studying and still trying to become Buddhas. Imagine all sentient beings are all around us. Imagine the hell beings are around us, the hungry ghost beings are around us, animals are around us, all human beings are around us, the demigods are all around us, the gods are all around us. Imagine all the beings in the six realms of cyclic existence, the three realms, every being is all around us. And we're leading them in these prayers. We're, we're leading them in these thoughts. Imagine that as we think about these thoughts, that the sentient beings individually uh, are thinking these thoughts. Imagine, oh, may all of these sentient beings understand this, understand what I'm thinking, and think in their way, in, in the way they would in their minds. Uh, so we have uh, these pure thoughts uh, that we put uh, into our minds. Um, and uh, as we're imagining them all around us, and we imagine all of the gurus and Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the space in front of us, we imagine that we're leading all of these beings in the prayers, uh, and that we've brought all of these beings by the hand to this teaching, uh, because we know that this is what will truly, truly, truly be of benefit. Uh, and this is like giving them the greatest gift that we could ever give them, the, the generosity of the Dharma. So sit with that visualization for a moment, and then we'll get into the Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge. So again, as we visualize all the gurus and Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the space in front of us, as we chant these prayers, imagine that all sentient beings are chanting them along with us. The Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge. Thus have I heard, once the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajagri at Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a great gathering of the Sangha of monks and a great gathering of the Sangha of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi that expresses the Dharma called profound illumination, and at the same time, noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, while practicing the profound Prajaparamita, saw in this way. He saw the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, how should a son or daughter of noble family train who wishes to practice a profound Prajaparamita? Addressed in this way, Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva said to Venerable Shariputra, O Shariputra, son or daughter of noble family who wishes to practice a profound Prajaparamita should see in this way, seeing the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Form is emptiness, emptiness also is form. Emptiness is no other than form, form is no other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness are emptiness. Thus, Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness. There are no characteristics. There is no birth and no cessation. There is no impurity and no purity. There is no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Shariputra, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no formation, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no dharmas, no eye, dot to, up to, no mind, dot to, no dot to of dharmas, no mind, consciousness, dot to, no ignorance, no ignorance, up to no old age and death. No end of old age and death, no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering, no path, no wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment. Therefore, Shariputra, since the Bodhisattvas have no attainment, they abide by means of Prajnaparamita. Since there is no obscuration of mind, there is no fear. They transcend falsity and attain complete nirvana. All the Buddhas of the three times by means of Prajnaparamita fully awaken to unsurpassable, true, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the great mantra of Prajnaparamita, the mantra of great insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequal mantra, the mantra that calms all suffering should be known as truth since there is no deception. Prajnaparamita Paramita mantra is said in this way, Teata Om Gate Gate, Paragate, Parasangate, 
Bodhisoha, the Shariputta, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva should train the profound Rajaparamita. Then the Blessed One arose from that Samadhi and praised Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, saying, Good, good, O son of noble family, thus it is, O son of noble family, thus it is. One should practice a profound Prajaparamita just as you have taught, and all the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra and Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, that whole assembly in the world with its gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, rejoiced and praised the words of the Blessed One. Gala jube ne jo damba ne nguje do jung a yi do do jendra babo lama yi bu jin zi ne zong gandro zola jaze lo gazamara do jonara do me. Aga Samara Tashana Razamara Yame De Ata Unga Dika De Baraka De Barasanga De Bati Soha Baba Gancho Sanchi Kai De Me Doji Shri Lopo Doji Mepo Doji Shri Wa Doji Dragi Bajin Metun Peshu Tanchi Shri Tengko Yi Soha Giri In Tung Cha Chi Chi Shri Wa Dan Metun Nui Peshu Tan Chai Wa Dan Tung Pa Tung Chi Mpun Son Son Cho Chi Ta Shi Pichan Ten Ta De Le Shri the fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. Holy Lamas High, wrap the sky of your Dharma bodies in massive clouds of knowledge and love and let them pour upon the earth of your disciples as we are ready a shower of rain, the teachings deep and wide. <laughs> I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious Guru. Idam Guru Rana Mandala Gani Radha Yami Sanji Jadan Zaji Janala Janju Badu Dani Jazuji Dagi Jishi Bezananji Jala Benji Sanji Jubaju Sanji Jadan Zaji Janala Janju Badu Dani Jazuji Dagi Jishi Bezananji Jala Benji Sanji Jubaju Sanji Jadan Zaji Janala Janju Badu Dani Jazuji Dagi Jishi Bezananji Jala Benji Sanji Jubaju All phenomena arise from causes. The causes are taught by the Tathagata. The cessation of the causes as well is taught by the great seer. Profound, peaceful, elaboration free, clear light and non-composite, such as the nectar-like Dharma I have discovered, finding no one who can fathom this teaching 
In silence, I will retire into the woods. Beyond utterance, thought, and expression is the perfection of wisdom, which is unborn, unceased, and has the nature of space. It is the object of apprehension of self-realized wisdom. To you, the mother of the Buddhas of the three times, I pay obeisance. I prostrate to the mothers of the hearers, the bodhisattvas and the Buddhas, who through the knowledge of all lead pa hearers seeking pacification to complete peace, who through the knowledge of past cause those helping migrators to achieve the aims of the world, and through the possession of omniscience help subduers expound a variety of teachings. The one who has transformed into the reliable guide motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings, the teacher Sugata and protector to you, I make prostrations. The one who has eliminated the web of conceptualizations and is endowed with the divine bodies, a vast and the profound, who eternally shines forth the forever noble light rays. To you, the Buddha, I make prostrations. I'm inspired by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind of full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. May this teaching be heard and understood in the language of all sentient beings. <clears throat> okay welcome everyone again uh i was having to chuckle to myself a little bit uh so uh, you can maybe shut off your uh perception of your eyes squinting at a 45 degree angle but can you shut off a pit bull <laughs> jumping up and trying to get something off of the table behind you while you are uh, trying to hold an object of observation or trying to engage in analysis. That's the real, you know, riddle me that question uh, for this evening. Uh, so I found that quite funny. But once again, here we are uh, looking at Pension Sun Andrapa's general meaning of perfection that has five categories. Uh, first category, basis. Uh, second category is cause. Uh, third category, nature, fourth cat nature or definitions, fourth category, divisions, and then fifth category, benefits. Uh, so these are the five categories the, the, of the outline uh, in which Pension, Pension Sonandrapa explains uh, the awakening mind, bodhicitta, in that specific check section of the general meaning of perfection, which is a commentary on Lord Maitreya's Abhisama Alamkara. Um, so this is a, a very, very wonderful text uh, and goes over this uh, topic in such great detail. So we've gone over the basis from which to get the aspiring and engaged bodhicitta. We went over the general causes and now we're in the specific causes or specific root causes for generating this mind that aspires to enlightenment, this mind uh, that wishes that all sentient beings just have ha the most amount of happiness they can possibly have uh, that wants all sentient beings to be free from suffering completely uh, and wants to uh, uh, be able uh, uh, to accomplish that in some way for them. Um, so it's so wonderful uh, to be able to learn about this this evening. And we're learning about specific root causes. Uh, we learn that there are two uh, in this section, one passed down from Maitreya, uh, which is called the seven point cause and effect for realizing the mind that aspires to enlightenment. We've gone over that very well. Uh, we learned that that was from the extensive deeds lineage passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Lord Maitreya, to Master Asanga, to Master Silimpa, to Master Atisha, Drontompa, the, the three Kadampa lineages, and then eventually to Lama Tsongkhapa. Um, and then Pension Sanandrapa being a student of the Galupa tradition, a student of, of Lama Tsongkhapa. Um, so uh, we see that extensive deeds lineage, you know, flowing down into us, you know, uh, flowing these teachings of the seven point cause and effect uh, down into us from Kensar Geshe Wandak. He, he gave us such great instructions on the seven point cause and effect. Uh, we went through the Lam Rim Chemo. Uh, you know, in its entirety over that 10 year period of time. Uh, and so many times over and over and over again, Rinpoche would mention that seven point cause and effect. Uh, so we spent some time on it uh, and we went through it in great detail so that we will eventually be able to realize the mind that aspires to enlightenment through it. Um, and then we got to the next practice, which was called equalizing and exchanging self with others. Uh, and this practice is passed down uh, from Buddha Shakyamuni 
to Lord Manjushri, the Buddha of Wisdom, right? Uh, to Nagarjuna, then all the way down through Shanti Deva uh, and uh, you know those great masters. Uh, eventually to Salimpa, uh, then to Achisha, then to Drontampa, then to very specific beings in a secret lineage that ends up at Lama Tsongkhapa, uh, and then to us from Kensar Geshe Wanda. Uh, so, so fortunate to have both of these lineages of instruction. And last week we learned that really we need an understanding of the seven point cause and effect instruction uh, to practice this equalizing and exchanging self with others. For kind of a dull capacity person like me, it really requires the more public explanation for me to work with, to be able to then couple that seven point cause and effect for realizing the mind that aspires to an, an enlightenment practice that was more public with the equalizing, exchanging self with others practice to make it potent uh, so that with the two in union, eventually, I could realize bodhicitta the fastest. Um, and that's what all of the great scholars agree in. They agree about this fact, you know, unless you're super, super sharp capacity, you know, there are those beings that could just maybe take this, you know, uh, um, equalizing and exchanging self with others, never have heard, you know, other things uh, um, and be able to really realize something very quickly with it if they were a sharp capacity practitioner. Um, perhaps there are those. Um, uh, but in, in case like someone like me, I need more uh, toys to play with in order to be satisfied, in order to keep my attention, in order to, to truly understand, uh, you know, all the, you know, have all these learning tools, if you will, right? In education, you call them learning tools, right? Blocks with the ABCs for children and so on and so forth. And they get more sophisticated uh, as the level of education becomes sophisticated, but there are these learning tools. Uh, and someone like myself, who isn't as sharp, needs more learning tools to learn how to care about others more than myself. Because all I do is care about myself and I see myself as the most important thing in the universe when the lights are off and I'm real honest, you know, <laughs> when I'm real honest with myself, you know, I'm the one who's feeling this. I'm the one who has that. I'm the one at the end of the day who has to, you know, you know, we really, really are just overwhelmed by this thing that's never done us any good. Uh, um, uh, it, it never has. So for someone like me, that's just so saturated all the time with it. Um, and doesn't have this sharp capacity, hasn't seen emptiness or isn't right on the verge of it because I have such great, you know, single pointed concentration. But now, you know, I'm doubling back and looking at, you know, uh, at something and I'm so sharp that I can just, you know, zero in on it. I need these learning tools. I need these props. I need all these things. And eventually we don't need, need them, you know, because we have it embedded in our mind. Uh, and then our mind becomes the, our teacher because, you know, the memory of, of these things becomes the teacher. Uh, and that's how we can gain that wisdom through meditation because we've heard it and analyzed it. And now we can actually embed it, right? We can realize it. Um, so, so fortunate are we uh, that we have this opportunity to learn this tradition and learn it properly, not learn it in a halfway, not learn it as a way to remove stress sometimes, learn it in a way to remove cyclic existence remove the obstructions to omniscience, right? Remove the afflictive obstructions and remove the cognitive ob obstructions or the obstructions to omniscience, right? Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to use it for that, not to, just tr not to make our day better, we're gonna try to use it to make our day and everyone's days and all days better. <laughs> uh, so that's what we're gonna use this, this practice of equalizing and exchanging self with others. Uh, so because it's such a serious thing we're trying to accomplish, we're not just trying to accomplish something like so trivial, we're trying to accomplish this something as serious as our infinite happiness, our, you know, cessation of suffering altogether, and, and our uh, ability to bring every sentient being to that state. Um, so that's the seriousness of the endeavor that we're uh, um, partaking in. Um, so uh, we really, really need the foundational practices. So when we look at um, where does this tradition come from, we throw all these names out and it's more foreign than some of the other stuff we talk about. So I just want to take about five or 10 minutes 
uh, to talk about this tradition, uh, to kind of understand it a little bit. Um, so where does this tradition stem from? Of course, it stems from Buddha Shakyamuni. Um, you know, it doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes from Buddha Shakyamuni, who teaches it to Manjushri, and then Manjushri teaches it, uh, you know, uh, it goes down to Nagarjuna. Um, now, uh, Nagarjuna, uh, we can find uh, right in the, um, the letter to a friend where it says, you know, may all the suffering of others come on me and may all the virtues of me go to them, right? Uh, so we see right in Nagarjuna's text, uh, this giving and taking practice, this exchange of self and others, this exchange of this attitude, which I cherish myself uh, to an attitude which cherishes others. We see it right in Nagarjuna's uh, writings uh, so clearly um, in Shanti Deva's uh, writings where we see that, you know, all the, um, you know, horrible things, all the sufferings of the world come from cherishing ourselves, all the uh, wonders of the world, all the wonderful things come from cherishing others. The Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas cherish others. We cherish ourselves. Look at the difference, right? Look in the difference between these two. So we we find the root of these teachings, right, uh, in, in the Indian tradition passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni. Um, and then uh, where does it go from there? Um, you know, uh, um, how does it end up? Well, it ends up, you know, with Lord Atisha. We have another friend now coming. Suma has come to join the show <laughs> to learn about Bodhicitta. Um, so it eventually ends up at uh, Lord, Lord Atisha, um, uh, this, this teaching uh, on the secret teaching of the equalizing and exchanging self with others. Um, and then Atisha, uh, passes it down uh, to Dron Tompa, uh, who is a lay person, as we all know. Uh, so no excuses. Oh, I'm not an ordained. Well, the holder of uh, Atisha Slam Rim lineage wasn't either. Uh, and uh, he was able to get it, the entire lineage to us by teaching, you know, thousands of disciples. Uh, so it was okay. Um, but so this teaching goes down through this profound view lineage and ends up at Atisha and then Drone Tompa. And then Drone Tompa is very particular about who he gives these teachings to. Um, we know that there's the, uh, um, you know, the three uh, um, Kadampa traditions. And we know that there's this, the three main uh, um, disciples. Uh, um, so Geshe Patawa. Uh, is among those three uh, uh, disciples that Dron Tompa teaches. And Geshe Patawa is the one who holds all, all of these teachings. Um, and then Geshe Patawa is Geshe Langri Tamba's teacher. Langri Tamba, the eight verses for training the mind uh, that we hear so much about. Uh, that goes from Atisha to Dron Tompa to Patawa to Geshe, to Geshe to Langri Tamba. Um, Okay, so the eight verses for training the mind uh, uh, is from this master, Langri Tamba, um, uh, who uh, um, uh, has this understanding. So then, uh, this is a, an important text in, in the mind training tradition, right? The eight verses for training the mind. Uh, it's one of the texts that is cited very often. Uh, so we can see, and we read this now at the end of class, so it's wonderful to know, right? Uh, this is from the profound view lineage, you know, ends up at Atisha, then to Drone Tompa, uh, then to Geshe Patawa, then to Langri Tamba, uh, and then eventually to Kenser Geshe Wandak and to us. Uh, so we have the transmission of this text. I do have the transmission of this text. Uh, many of you do too, uh, from Kenser Geshe Wandak. So I can give you the transmission of this text if you don't have it. Uh, Rinpoche has given me permission to give the transmission of any of the texts that I have transmissions of. Um, so um, that being said, so that's the eight verses for training the mind. So uh, what's, what significance does that play? Then we have this other text called the seven point thought transformation, another text on mind training that Rinpoche taught us extensively in the very early days. Um, this is written uh, um, by Geshe Chikawa. Um, and the story uh, um, of, of, of Geshe Chikawa uh, is that he comes into contact uh, with uh, this text, the eight verses uh, for training the mind, um, and is very, very interested in it. Um, uh, and he wants to learn more about it. 
Um, he's learned so much uh, about all of the teachings uh, and, uh, you know, he's, he's really, really uh, um, understanding that this practice uh, is something that is special from reading the eight verses for training the mind, probably been exposed to, we can infer the seven point tr thought transformation at this point, because that was more of a public teaching. So Geshe Chikawa hears that the one who can give the teaching on this uh, is Sharawa, um, who is uh, uh, in the lineage now, right? Geshe Patawa to Sharawa. So it's now in, in, in another going down a little bit further, um, but it goes from now Patawa to Sharawa uh, to uh, Geshe Chikawa. So Geshe Chikawa seeks out Sharawa. Uh, and he gets to uh, Sharawa, uh, and he's giving a teaching on the lesser vehicle <laughs> to a large group of people. And he's thinking to himself, what's going on here? <gasps> I came here for this secret teachings on equalizing, exchanging self with others that this person is like so famous for. And he's teaching the here a solitary realizer vehicle to massive amounts of people. Like what is going on here? I just, I can't, <gasps> I can't understand this. Um, so he says, I, all right, I've got to find someone else, you know, clearly. And he goes up to, uh, uh, um, as the story goes, right? Uh, he goes up to um, Shirawa and says, uh, is that all you have uh, to teach, you know? Um, and he, he says to him, yes, like, there's nothing more. Uh, so he's like, okay, you know, he doesn't inquire much further. He packs his stuff um, and he gets up in the morning. Maybe he's going to leave, you know? Um, and he sees Shirawa circumambulating, uh, and he says to Shirawa, you know, can I, can I have your ear for a moment? He says, I'll just give it one last try. This can't, this makes no sense. What's what I'm experiencing, um, what's going on here. Um, and Shirawa, you know, has to stop what he's doing and sits down. Right. But he's abandoned to spiritedness, right? We've learned that that, that is, you know. Uh, a teacher is willing to say something over and over again. Maybe he has to say again, I've taught you everything I've already needed to, right? Uh, so he's abandoned to spiritness. So he sits down to hear uh, what Geshe Chikawa has to say. Uh, and Geshe Chikawa says, have not have you nothing else to teach? And, and Shirawa says, I have nothing else. I already told you that. There's nothing more that I can teach you. I've taught you what I know. And then uh, Geshe Chikawa says, well, I have this text that I've heard you know about uh, called The Eight Verses for Training the Mind uh, by Langri Tamba. And I want to know if it's a valuable piece of information. It's short, right? Eight verses. Is this valuable? Is this something that's helpful? And then Shirawa turns to him and says, uh, without understanding and realizing it, there's no way to Buddhahood. <laughs> So then he spends 12 years with Shirawa to understand how to develop this mind that puts others before yourself ultimately. Uh, he spends all of these years to learn how, and then he writes the seven point thought transformation. Um, so this is Geshe Chikawa. So another text that we hear about is uh, Nam Kipel's mind training like the rays of the sun. All these texts I'm incorporating into this teaching. So. You might as well know a little, you know, you know bibliography <laughs> about the author, the greatness of the author, right? And the greatness of, of the teaching. Um, so next, uh, we have this text called Mind Training Like the Rays of the Sun by Nanka Pell. Nanka Pell was a student of Tsongkhapa um, and received this teaching. Um, it says from a, one, from the direct student of Tome Sampo. Um, so... Uh, the teaching on the seven point cause and effect. I'm, I'm sorry, the seven point thought transformation. Easy to mix those up, different things. So if you hear me mixing them up, just know it's me speaking funny. <laughs> seven, we're talking mind training, we're talking seven point thought uh, transformation, um, as opposed to the seven point cause and effect. Seven point cause and effect is the practice. Seven point thought transformation is a text. So the seven point thought transformation is a text by Geshe Chikawa. Okay, so um, Nanka Pell wrote Mind Training Like the Rays of the Sun, uh, which is a commentary on the seven point thought transformation. Very famous commentary, a lot of Geshe's use 
in order to explain the seven point thought transformation. Uh, Nankya Pell uh, received the teaching uh, um, from the student of Tome Zampo. Tome Zampo wrote the 37 practices of the Bodhisattva. Dalai Lama gives teachings on that or used to quite a bit. Um, and Tome Zampo, uh, this particular text is considered a mind training text, but can also be explained according to the Lam Rim tradition. Uh, so Tome Zampo's student uh, was the teacher of Nam Kapel, and also Tsongkhapa was the teacher, uh, it says, of Nam Kapel. Um, so mind training like the rays of the sun is an incredible commentary on the seven point thought transformation and there's great points uh, that are made uh, that we'll be able to cite uh, and use for this teaching. Okay, so uh, without further ado, let's go back to our outline. Uh, let's make sure that we know uh, the outline uh, and we can uh, be clear uh, on what we're getting into uh, this evening. Okay, so we look at the equalizing and exchanging self with others practice. Uh, last week, uh, we said that there were going to be uh, nine uh, steps, basically, that would get us there. Um, eight causes, but nine, nine steps is what we're going to call it. So the first is equalizing self and others. Uh, the second is reflecting on the demerits of cherishing oneself. The third is reflecting on the benefits or the good qualities of cherishing others. Uh, the fourth is taking on the suffering of others of, out of great compassion. Uh, the fifth is giving your happiness to others, uh, wishing love, giving them love, giving them happiness. Uh, um, the sixth is the actual exchange that takes place where you put others' needs before your own. Uh, and then the seventh is a remembrance of the special kindness that they've shown you. Uh, and then the eighth is this kind of extraordinary attitude that's like uh, um, on steroids, like we said, uh, compared to where you got to um, um, uh, in the uh, seven point cause and effect for realizing the mind that aspires to enlightenment, where we see that extraordinary attitude, uh, which we call altruism also. Um, here it's so, so powerful uh, because we've built it up to this point now. We're just, we're just reminding ourselves of just how kind all these beings are uh, that we have love and compassion for, and then we have to become a bright a Buddha. Um, so it kind of like pushes us off uh, the cliff uh, into bodhicitta, uh, if you will, um, with it, at this point. It's very, very forceful. Um, so uh, where did we start? Uh, we first said that... Um, you know, it would be necessary, and according to the mind training like the rays of the sun, uh, it's necessary to first train in the preliminaries. Uh, so what are the preliminaries? Uh, when we read mind training like the rays of the sun, it goes through all of the kind of lam rim topics that you would imagine you would need to go through based on the teachings that we have been to. <laughs> we know that all of the earlier um, scopes are necessary to get to the great scope. We know that's why they're called shared in common. So in Namke Pell's commentary, where it says in the seven point thought transformation, it says first train in the preliminaries. So then Namke Pell says, what are the preliminaries? And then Namke Pell goes into the Lam Rim topics. He goes into the human life of leisure and opportunity. He goes into the three roots and nine reasons step death meditation. He goes through all of the teachings shared in common with beings of small capacity, and then the teachings shared in common with beings of medium capacity. He goes through all of them about karma and its results uh, and so forth, right? It, refuge, and then the downfalls of cyclic existence. He goes through all of the things, what we meditate on, right? When we set our motivation before class, he goes through all of those things. And then basically says, and I, you know, I'm kind of summarizing it. He says, uh, once you've realized all of these things and you have renunciation, now you're ready. <laughs> now that you have a desire to definitely emerge from cyclic existence and you definitely want to get out, you understand the eight types of suffering, the six types of suffering, the three types of suffering. You believe them. You believe you want to be free from them, right? And you definitely, day and night, as it says in Lama Tsongkhapa's Three Principles of the Path, day and night, 
when you're thinking of getting out of cyclic existence, at that point, you know you have renunciation. That's the definition of re renunciation. Folks would agree on it, uh, that the definition of renunciation is day and night, thinking of getting out of cyclic existence. Everything that we're doing, we're doing to get out of cyclic existence. So once you have this mind that day and night wants to get out of cyclic existence, then you're ready uh, to develop this equanimity that it's talking about, this equalizing of self and others. So it's interesting uh, that we really need these preliminaries. It just says it over and over and over again. Um, it's not just to be boring. Uh, it's not just to uh, say something we've heard a million times. It's to ingrain it in ourselves. It's to make it part of us. It's to know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, we want to be free from the lower realms of cyclic existence because of the suffering of the hell, hungry ghosts and animals. And that we want to be free from all six realms of cyclic existence because of the suffering of all of the realms. Even the higher realms have the suffering of pervasive compounded suffering. We have to understand what that means. We have to want to get out of every form of, of suffering that there is in order to think about getting others out. Shanti Deva says, if we haven't even dreamed of getting ourselves out of cyclic existence, how could we imagine helping others? So we have to understand so clearly and have that wisdom that is so sharp, that knows we have to do this, we have to get out. Uh, that then we look to our left, we look to our right, we look up and we look down and we see that all other beings are in this same horrible situation that we're in, but it's not horrible because it's from this basis that we can be free and not have to experience the suffering. It's by knowing what the suffering is and not believing that the happiness we think is happiness uh, is happiness and knowing that it's suffering that allows us to be free. This, this information about suffering is information that allows us to be liberated. It's not negative information. Once we can identify that which we want to be free from, we can get to work. It will allow us to want to get to work. If we don't know that we're going to die and we don't know when we're going to die, why should we do it today? We don't have that right just the moment we wake up, oh my God, I have this human life of leisure and opportunity, but I may die. And the only thing that can help is Dharma. When we have that taste, then we can say, the only thing that can help everyone else is Dharma. They're as important as I am. And, 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 and you know, deserving, right? to be free from suffering and deserving to have that happiness that I want. You see how it goes to that? I deserve to be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. I wanna get out. Now I'm saying you do too. You deserve to also. So it's in dependence upon what I know about myself that I say, I deserve this. I love myself. I don't hate myself. I want to be free from suffering. I want to definitely emerge from cyclic existence. You deserve that too. I love you too. It's this transition. I love myself. I love you too. To I love you more than myself. That's the transition we're going through I love you more than myself because that's how I love myself, right? I love myself. I love you and I love myself. I love you more than myself because that's the best way to love myself. That's where we go through with this mind training. But we have to first say, I love myself. I definitely want to get out. I deserve to get out. I definitely want to emerge. You have to think you deserve that, right? If you want to definitely emerge, so I definitely deserve to emerge. Now I'm switching. You do too. You definitely do too, right? So that's this first step, equalizing self and others. You're just as important as me. Normally, I think I'm the most important person in the world. Now I'm starting to see, just like myself, you want happiness. You want to be free from suffering. There's no more intensity 
in happiness feelings when I'm happy, right? The feeling I get in happiness and the feeling you get when you're happy. Those are both happy feelings. I know what that feels like. There's no difference in intensity for the, the parties. When I, in order for me to establish myself, there has to be other, neither inherently existent. Self doesn't inherently exist. Other doesn't inherently exist. Self is, is other to another self. I am self because I posit something other than myself. Something other than myself posit it to be itself because there's something other than itself. Neither are truly established, both dependently originate. There is no solid self. There is no solid other. There is no duality. There's a non-duality. There's a lack of inherent existence. Our nature is exactly the same. You want happiness and I want happiness. That more coarse nature, right, is also the same. You have Buddha nature, I have Buddha nature. That's also the same. Wouldn't you say someone who could save the world would be the most important person in the world? We all equally have Buddha nature. So we all equally can save the world. So we're all equally the most important people in the world. So these are the meditations that we do to change our minds about the fact that you aren't as important as I am. I'm not saying you're more important than me yet. It's a gradual process. So now this is assuming you've meditated all sentient beings have been my mother, right? Remembering their kindness, wishing to repay their kindness. You've had this kind of basis. You've understand that since beginningless time, all sentient beings have been your mother, have been your brother, have been your sister. You've done these meditations, friends, enemies, and neutrals, that your friends become your enemies, your enemies become your friends, right? People who were your friends become neutral to you. People who are your enemies become neutral to you. You forget about them, right? Just like those people you kind of discard or forget about. Um, so you, you see, you've meditated on all these kind of things, and now you're adding in these other facts. You're adding in, you're just as important as I am. What's so important about me? I want happiness, you want happiness, right? Uh, you have Buddha nature, I have Buddha nature. You may become a Buddha before me. You may be my only hope. It's in dependence upon you that I can uh, engage in the six perfections, many of the, in, of the six perfections. It's in dependence upon you that I can get bodhicitta. It's in dependence upon you that I can get rid of the self-cherishing attitude. It's in dependence upon getting rid of the self-cherishing attitude and it's at its gross and subtle levels that I can become a Buddha. You're equally as important as I am. Independence upon me, you will be able to get bodhicitta. I'm equally as important as you are to you. So you start to see this much more complex interplay that's going on, right? Uh, now we've understood beginningless time. We've understood all these relationships. We've understood karma. We've understood that we've been thrown into aggregates by our throwing karma again and again. And all the details have been completed by our completing karma uh, over and over and over again. And in those lives, we've had all these different relationships again and again and again. And you've been as close as you can to me in many, many different times, in many different circumstances since beginningless time. And now I recognize that not only have you been so kind to me, but no matter who you are, you're as important as any, you're as important as I am. So it starts to say, so, okay, if that's not enough, put that aside. Okay, that since beginningless time, you've been so kind. Let's use some more logic, if that's not enough. Put that aside. Put beginningless time aside. Let's look at everyday life. Let's look at some basic facts. You want happiness, I want happiness. You have Buddha nature, I have Buddha nature. You may be my savior in terms of being a Buddha before I am. You are my savior because you're how I get rid of self-cherishing attitude. It's amazing when you see the interdependence of all sentient beings and you see how every sentient being other than me will be responsible for my Buddhahood every sentient being. Because in order for me to become a Buddha, 
my object of observation has to be all sentient beings. So every sentient being will be required for me to become a Buddha. The hearers and solitary realizers, they have love and compassion that's immeasurable, that we can't measure, but it's not all sentient beings. They're missing. They're missing a level. They're missing that, that I'll do this for everyone part. Uh, so they have stains still in their minds and their, their realizations aren't complete. Um, uh, so in, in order for us to completely abandon the obstructions to omniscience, which will be necessary in order for us to be Buddhas, uh, and if we're abandoning the obstructions to omniscience, we're abandoning the afflictive obstructions. If we're engaging in a pathway which would do one, it washes the other, right? If we're engaging in something that washes the subtle things, the coarse things are going to be washed. Um, so if we're in, engaging in this pathway uh, 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 that, that requires us to remove these very subtle obstructions, the subtle uh, grasping uh, um, uh, at our, our cherishing ourselves, um, then it's going to be necessary for us to um, apply every kind of antidote uh, and use every sentient being um, to so that we don't have any lingering self-cherishing left. We have to make sure that there is no one left out to know we don't cherish ourselves even a little. Does that make sense? So if we leave any sentient being out, then we still cherish ourselves a little because we see that we're more important than some. So that's why the the Hinayana here and, and, and solitary realizer still has that stain uh, because there, there isn't that kind of idea about the importance of all sentient beings uh, needs above their own because they've chosen to become free for themselves, right? Um, you know, even though they're helpful to sentient beings and they love them, they have compassion for them. They just don't have that vast mind that can get rid of that final stain uh, because they're not willing to cherish each and every being and then cherish them more than themselves. Um, so we have to get to the point where this equal idea is seeing all sentient beings equally. The hell being, if we were in hell, right, we would want a little cool. <laughs> if we were a hungry ghost, we would, we would we, uh, want a, something a little to drink. Uh, if, if we were an animal, we would just want some peace of mind and not to be led around and told what to do, right? And just somewhere safe to sleep and not have to worry about being eaten, right? Um, so we think about all beings just want happiness like we do. Um, and we put that kind of on an equal ground. We aren't trying to do more than that uh, at this step. Um, so reflecting on the, the demerits of cherishing uh, ourselves, uh, so then in the uh, mind training text, it says, uh, um, banish the one to blame for everything. Sometimes it's translated a little bit differently, um, um, but it's, you know, like pinpoint, get rid of, you know, root out the one to blame for everything. Uh, so what is the one to blame for everything? Well, we would say uh, that we have to be technically accurate. We would say it's the grasping at the eye as being truly established which then gives rise to the idea that I'm the most important person in the world and I be become, a, by, because I become attached to myself. So first this idea of I and mine, these are my hands, okay. I am Jeff, this, this is me, this is mine. Uh, and oh, I'm so wonderful. I become so attached to, to me. And then I cherish me and I don't cherish you because you're other, right? I'm attached to me. I'm not attached to you. It's got, you know, cherishing others becomes like a role reversal, right? Like where you're, you, you know, you're, you're just taking that cherishing that, oh, I love myself so much and that power and you're going, Urgh! and you're aiming that at, at others, that same power and you're cherishing them. Uh, with that same power. 
uh, but it doesn't just come about by magic. It comes about through this process that uh, we're speaking about. So it says, uh, banish the one to blame for everything. And then you'll see uh, in the mind training teachings that it goes in, it goes on and on and on uh, about uh, the downfalls of cherishing ourselves. Um, you know, what are the disadvantages of cherishing ourselves? So it says, banish uh, the one to blame for everything. And the guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life says, however much torment, fear, and suffering uh, there is in the world, it all arises from the misconception of self. Uh, oh, what trouble this great ghost brings to me, right? Uh, so uh, this misconception of self brings about this attachment that makes me cherish I. Uh, so first it starts with this misconception of L self, and then I cherish myself uh, more than others. Um, it says uh, uh, the same text, thus though long unbroken contact, he is our foe, sole cause of our ever increasing heap of trouble. When we are certain of this in our hearts, how can we be happy and unafraid uh, in cyclic existence? So uh, then it goes on, it goes on then uh, to say uh, that it is this self-cherishing attitude that brings us uh, so much pain uh, over and over and over again. It says we fight with swords and arrows, right? We fight everyone, we fight everything in hope of gaining some sort of victory or some sort of profit or being right. Uh, and then in, when we lose, we go home and we console ourselves, the mind training text says, and we say it's their fault. We've been hurling daggers and yelling and screaming and created all this chaos. Uh, and then we lose at what we're trying to gain through this disastrous way of cherishing ourselves and not thinking of anyone else, leaving everyone else in this wake and just plowing through the life, thinking we're so important. Uh, and then when that doesn't work, we don't look at the fact that we were just cherishing ourselves and we weren't thinking at any, of anyone else. We go home and we blame everyone else. We go console ourselves and we say, oh, I feel so bad for myself. Everybody's against me. Everybody's out to get me. Uh, and we just blame everyone. We blame our teachers. We blame our friends. We blame those who are close to us. We blame our parents. <sighs> we blame everyone we can instead of the self-cherishing attitude. Um, because we haven't gone about things properly. Uh, we've harmed others. We've said harsh words uh, and so forth. And we never, we never want to look at how the self-cherishing attitude uh, is it, like this naked, empty-handed slob. I love this. It says in uh, uh, Nankapel's text, it says it's this naked, empty-handed slob that's just like overindulgent that dwells within us. And why is it empty-handed? It brings us nothing right? It's this naked thing with and nothing in its hands, this self-cherishing attitude. It's never brought us anything. It's just this slob that lives within us that just overindulges in everything and never, ever, ever has found any happiness in that exercise. This self-cherishing attitude that says, I'm the most important person in the world. This is all we've ever thought. But here we are, Suffering, the eight types of suffering, the six types of suffering, and the three types of suffering. Again, we've been driven by the self-cherishing attitude. We haven't cherished others. The Buddhists cherished others. They're in their state. We cherished ourselves. Here we are in cyclic existence, having to see our loved ones leave, having to get illnesses, having to have all of these unfortunate things happen, having our hopes get up and then have them fall thinking we have this in, infinite happiness that we found, this new thing, and then it stops making us happy, right? Uh, so we've had all of this happen over and over and over again. And all of these circumstances are a result of the self-cherishing attitude. And we think that, the, that happiness, that we seek out happiness, and it's really just bait. It's really just more suffering to keep us in more cyclic existence. Why are we seeking out? Why do we want to feel so good? Hear such good things. Go to such wonderful places. See such beautiful things because we cherish ourselves. And when we go see these things, we're dissatisfied. Our self-cherishing attitude has led us on a quest of dissatisfaction one more time. I want this. I want that. That'll make me happy. I grasp at me. I'm attached to me. I have to make me happy. 
by in any means necessary. I don't think that you play any part in that unless you're going to give me something. I don't see that me cherishing you plays any part in me getting happiness. I actually see your happiness at times as an obstacle to my happiness. And this causes me to suffer again and again and again. I often see your happiness as an obstacle to my happiness. So how can we say we wanna love others if we see their happiness as an obstacle to our own? When we say we cherish friends, enemies, and neutrals, when we look at enemies, enemies usually become enemies because they're looking for happiness and their happiness collides with our wish for happiness. We don't want, we think our happiness is more important than theirs. So they're an enemy now because they think their happiness is more important than ours. So they're acting in a way towards us and all of it's just happening because of karma and has no inherent existence from its own side. Very subtle teachings in the mind training texts. Uh, so we have all of these horrible behaviors that we do again and again and again, yet still we're, we're like a glutton, constant, like, uh, you know, in, in cyclic existence, engrossed in it. We've heard all of these things a million times. Yet we're still here. We're still engrossed in things. So it's true, you know, the self-cherishing attitude that kind of leads us around by the nose is this thing we think is so great, this thing that we pay homage to, but it's really just an empty-handed, naked slob that overindulges, that'll never find happiness, ever, ever find happiness. No happiness was ever found from self-cherishing. Because even the hearers and solitary realizers abandon the gross self-cherishing attitude. So be clear on that. Don't, don't think, oh, they're in nirvana for themselves. They have this gross self-cherishing. They abandon that. It's the subtle self-cherishing they haven't abandoned. Um, so. Uh, understand that that is why over and over and over again, we have to have incomplete forms of happiness. I say incomplete because you, you think you're there, you think you're there, you think you're there, you think you're happy, you think you're happy, you think you're happy, and it changes. And you realize, oh, this is just a form of suffering. Um, it's incomplete. Uh, and again and again and again, uh, this ignorance has led us to that. We've grasped at the eye as being truly established. Uh, then we've thought that we were the most important thing in the world uh, and that our body is the most important body in the world. Uh, what we say is the most important thing in the world. <sighs> you know, everyone should listen, right? What we listen to should only be important things. Only things that we like to hear, that are pleasant to hear. As soon as somebody says something that we find unpleasant, even if it's good for us, we, we find it, it doesn't sound good, right? We can even hear kind words is bad because the self-cherishing attitude is just so, so uh, just has like such a thin skin, right? Someone can be helping us and the self-cherishing attitude gets a little, you know, hurt and it lashes out, right? Someone's actually helping us, gonna allow us to move forward and be, you know, maybe even have more happiness, and the self-cherishing attitude won't even let us have it. Won't even let us hear good advice. The self-cherishing attitude does this at teachings. We hear about the sufferings and the suffering, the self-cherishing attitude's like, I don't wanna hear about suffering. It gets uncomfortable. Suffering of death, I'm gonna die. People have died around me. That makes me so uncomfortable. It makes me so sad. It's so painful. Well, that's the motivation to be do spiritual practice, right? It, that un discomfort is your self-cherishing attitude feeling uncomfortable that's what's shaking when it's you're hearing about suffering and it's like oh god i don't want to you know or it feels a little boring your self-cherishing attitude's bored it just wants to go play and go do something that's not significant go engage in you know fighting with swords and arrows and spears and yelling and screaming and dancing you know and carrying on and then being so dissatisfied with all of it 
and then going home and consoling yourself and saying, everybody else has caused me all the suffering. That's what the self-cherishing attitude has done for us. That's what our big friend, the self-cherishing attitude says for us. So then Shanti Deva says, once you've realized these things that I've said, that all the jealousy, I cherish myself, so I'm jealous of what you have. I think I should have more than you, right? I'd hate you because you've said something I don't like. All of the negativities come from the self-cherishing attitude. I react. I have to, I'm so worried you're going to take my things. I have so much fear and anxiety about you taking my things. I cherish myself. I have to have the best things. This isn't good enough. I need more. This isn't good enough. I need more is a whole state of dissatisfaction the self-cherishing attitude creates. We think it's due. Oh, we're, we care so much about ourselves. But all it does is make us unsatisfied. I need more. I need to feel better. This isn't enough. This is dissat this is I'm dissatisfied with this current state of happiness. And it says in the condensed perfection of wisdom that that's the illness. That's the disease. You have everything you want. You're comfortable. You're still so dissatisfied. What's wrong here? What's wrong here is all of those things were were chased after because of a self-cherishing attitude and grasping at things as being truly established that just fuels it. First you grasp itself, then you become attached to self, and then you think you're the most important thing there is. And Shanti Deva says, once you understand the downfalls of this self-cherishing attitude, you'll look at it like this. Those earlier times when you overcame me are past. <laughs> now I see you in another light, right? Now this self-cherishing attitude that sees myself as more important than others that has just caused me nothing but suffering over and over and over again, which hasn't been the cause for my infinite happiness, will never be the cause for me to be free from suffering. Now that I see you in that light, this thing I thought, you know, that Darwin would say, right, was so important that we just, you know, we, we have anger, so, that, you know, we react so that, you know, it's like a, a survival mechanisms that we can't get rid of, right? But Shanti Dave is saying, yes, we certainly can get rid of them. And they aren't good. <laughs> they aren't actually allowing us uh, there to survive. It's very interesting. Shanti Deva and all the masters in Buddha Shakyamuni would say, it's the only thing that's making us die. <laughs> this self-cherishing attitude, you know, the grasping at the eye is the reason we have to die. Right? Uh, so now I'm seeing it in a different light. I'm seeing this grasping at eye that causes this self-cherishing attitude uh, in a different light. And wherever I go, I'm gonna destroy its arrogance, Shanti Davis says. Uh, so this arrogant self-cherishing attitude that leads me around, it's so arrogant. It's really just a slob. It's really just this naked, empty-handed slob that I thought was my hero, right? Now that I, I, I see who you really are, self-cherishing attitude, how arrogant you are to think that you're bringing me good places. How arrogant. You've never done anything good for me, yet you keep controlling me. How arrogant. So Shanti Deva calls it, I'll destroy your arrogance, Shanti Deva says, and the guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life. And then he says, having sold you to others, I shall not be upset. My self-cherishing, I cherish others. I, I sold it. I've given it to others. Having sold you to others, I shall not be upset. If I want happiness, I give my cherishing to others. At having offended you in their service, if I should be negligent and not give you to other sentient beings. Let me say it again. Having sold you to others, I shall not be upset at having offered you into their service, if I should be negligent and not give you to other sentient beings. You will certainly deliver me to the guardians of hell if that should take place. My miserable misery will be interminable. Now recalling my grudges against you, I shall destroy your concern for your own good. Um, so the self-cherishing attitude doesn't do me any good. This thing that I, I think is protecting me does me no good. It hurts me. And, and knowing that, Shanti Davis says, I'm going to cherish others. Basically, in summary, what he's saying here is, I'm going to cherish others. 
I'm going to offer myself and be the service of others. Uh, and if I should ever give up sentient beings, I'll certainly be born in, in, the, uh, in a place where there are the guardians of hell abide, right? This self-cherishing attitude, which I think protects me, brings me to hell. And Shanti Davis says, I can't lose sight of that. Don't let me lose sight of that. That this self-cherishing attitude is the cause of all my misery and will bring me down to all of the sufferings. And, and then Nankipel says, we need to keep this in mind. Um, uh, and then says, uh, besides, due to the strength of our acquaintance with a self-centered attitude over beginningless time, if we hear the squealing of rats in a house, we are frightened of them nibbling on our nose. Hearing a clap of thunder, we worry that our heads will be struck by lightning and coming to a haunted place, we are afraid. It is you self-centered attitude that causes our fear. Similarly, there are some who suffer from fear of bad talk and some who are upset at being unable to restrain their enemies and others who are distressed at being unable to support their family and friends. In short, in whatever ways and by whatever means they are tormented, we should realize the selfishness is the source of blame. Uh, so I'll end there. Uh, um, I think that's a good uh, um, introduction to the downfalls of the self-cherishing attitude. We can see how immense it is, right? Uh, we can see how uh, emptiness is so important to understand within this, that we grasp at our eye as being truly established, uh, and, and then we grasp at, at other, uh, and then we become attached to ourselves and we cherish ourselves, uh, and then we, we, we believe that um, because we have this ingrained ignorance and this ingrained selfishness that the way to our happiness is to be selfish. Um, but it's actually the way to our unhappiness. Uh, and the mind training allows us to change that concept that's so ingrained in our mind since beginningless time uh, into one uh, um, that works. The one that's been ingrained since beginningless time has caused us to be born again and again and again has caused us to have rebirth, has caused us to shuck off bodies, right? Higher than the highest of all mountains, uh, has caused us so many of those, those uh, negativities. Um, uh, so in order to not have to have those experiences over and over again, we have to apply an antidote. So um, uh, the self-cherishing attitude is a tough one. Um, uh, it's a hard place. Uh, to get rid of, um, or a hard state of mind to get rid of. Um, and that's why even the Hinayana hearers, right? And solitary realizers who are abiding in Nirvana, who have no more samsara, still have the subtle self-cherishing um, because they haven't learned this. This is the, you know, when Geshe Sharawa said, uh, when Geshe Chikawa asks, you know, is this eight verses for mind training, which we're about to read, important after Sharawa said, oh, I've taught you everything. There is, you know, I can teach you. And it's just been teaching lesser vehicle teachings. Uh, Geshe Sharawa looks uh, um, at Geshe Chikawa and says, it's the only thing that will allow you to become a Buddha, will allow you to have infinite happiness and complete freedom from suffering. Um, uh, so we see that we have to cherish others uh, um, and put others' needs before our own if we want uh, to become Buddhas. Um, and this is the only way we can do it. So um, what was that text that um, Geshe Shirawa said was the only uh, way you could become a Buddha? It's the eight verses on training the mind by Geshe Langritama. This is the text that Geshe Chikawa got into his hand uh, um, and saw uh, that this was the way to freedom and, and the infinite freedom. With the determination to accomplish the highest welfare of all sentient beings who surpass even a wish-granting jewel, I will learn to hold them supremely dear. Whenever I associate with others, I will learn to think of myself as the lowest amongst all and respectively hold others to be supreme from the very depths of my heart. In all actions, I will learn to search into my mind and as soon as a disturbing emotion arises endangering myself and others, I will firmly face and avert it. I will learn to cherish ill-natured beings and those oppressed by strong misdeeds and sufferings as if I had found a precious treasure difficult to find. When others out of uh, uh, jealousy treat me very badly with abuse, slander, and so on, 
I will learn to take all loss and offer victory to them. When the one whom I benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In short, I will learn to offer to everyone without exception all help and happiness directly and indirectly and respectfully take upon myself all the harm and suffering of my mothers. I will learn to keep all these practices undefiled by the stains of the eight worldly concerns and by understanding all phenomena as like illusions be released from the bondage of attachment. Concluding mandala offering and dedication prayer. And as we make these dedications, remember, uh, all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and Gurus in the space in front of us, Kensu Geshe Wandak in the space in front of us, we're surrounded by all sentient beings. Imagine we're all dedicating this virtue to becoming Buddhas for the sake of all uh, sentient beings. Imagine everybody is uh, around us uh, and that we're leading all sentient beings uh, in this prayer. Uh, so, uh, and remember that uh, this prayer is empty of true establishment. Uh, sentient beings we're leading are empty of true establishment. Uh, our leading itself is empty of true establishment. We are empty of true establishment. We are merely come into being through the power of nominal designation. So we need to understand as we do this mandal offering, it has no inherent existence. As we do the Samantabhadra dedication, it has no inherent existence. As we do the long life prayer for Holiness the Dalai Lama it has no inherent existence. And as we pray for meeting with Kensu Geshe Wandak in the future, uh, that prayer has no inherent existence. Praying itself has no inherent existence. We have no inherent existence because we dependently originate. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure land. I dedicate whatever virtues I have collected for the benefit of the teachings of all sentient beings, and in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Lozandrapa to shine forever. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious guru. I dedicate all this virtue to emulate the knowledge of the hero Manjushri and likewise Samantabhadra as well. With whatever dedication is praised the supreme by all the conquerors who traverse the three times, I also dedicate all my roots of virtue for the sake of auspicious deeds. In that pure land surrounded by snowy mountains, you are the source of all benefit and happiness, all powerful Abhagateshvara, Tenzin Jatso, May it stay until samsara's end. I pray that we may in all our lives meet with Kensu Geshe Wandak in whatever form he or she chooses to show us, uh, whether it's in an emanation body in our world system or in the uh, Sambukaya, the enjoyment body, when we see emptiness. Uh, may we never until we attain complete Buddhahood be separated uh, from him or her uh, in whatever form they emanate from the Dharmakaya. Uh, and may we join them when we become Buddhas in freeing all sentient beings from a state of suffering. May we seal this practice with the understanding that this practice dependently originates that we dependently originate. The eye is not truly established. It's merely designated on a collection. Other is merely nominally designation, designated on the basis on a collection. And we seal this practice with emptiness. Okay. So thank you, everyone. I hope everybody can come uh, see us at the live teaching. Uh, and um, yeah. I look forward to it and I hope everybody has a great week and can put these practices uh, into their daily life. Um, I think that they're very, very applicable. And I think that when we go slowly and look at these teachings like this, we're able to see how we can integrate them and have immediate results uh, instead of them just being information and categories that we let rattle around in our mind, but don't really know how to apply to our lives. So hopefully uh, everyone can apply them. And I thank you all for listening. Uh, and I thank you all for letting me to understand more about uh, Buddha Dharma uh, by speaking about it and leaving more imprints uh, for my future. Thank you.